So this is coming out of the homework set that I had last semester. Um, so this is, uh, can most people read this uh, question from where you are? Okay, let me leave it there while I erase the board um, and have you just think about the situation for a little bit. makes kind of sense. Let me try to use three-dimensional models to <laughs> explain what it's trying to describe in words. So this is um, a special relativity paradox. Ooh, I guess this kind of work. So this is approximately at the same length as this uh, ring. And this is the situation it's describing. Imagine this ruler is moving at relative speed horizontally. And as it's doing so, this ring is moving vertically. And they are both timed in such a way that when the middle of this comes to this origin is when the middle of this ring would also come to the origin. Yeah? So the idea is that if this is going very, very slowly, so very slowly this would pass through and this would be the motion. Now, um, the question that's being posed is, now imagine these are relativistic. What would happen as these go through? Will this um, ruler pass through the ring or will this um, hole kind of hit the ruler because the ruler doesn't fit anymore? I guess the, um, the motivation for this particular arrangement of situation is, um, so we've talked a little bit about what's sometimes called the pole in the barn paradox, right? Or um, train in a train station paradox. And I guess the way I've been conditioned to state, state it, I always state it in such a way that those moving things never come to a stop. <laughs> but uh, you will see that in many of the textbook versions, they ask the question more sloppily, as in they will ask, does the train fit in the station? Or does the ladder fit in the barn? Or will it you know, crash into things and disaster ensues? And in those situations, for a successful resolution of paradox, you really should never let the ladder come to rest. Because once the ladder comes to rest, then like, now the ladder and the barn are in the same reference frame. You have no relativistic effects to talk about. So this particular arrangement is a way to try to have a physically realistic scenario where you are not relying on any um, we are not explicitly relying on tools of observation, like taking pictures or dropping boys. That's in one of the <laughs> past exam questions. So here, all you have are these two physical objects. And you have arranged them in such a way that this moving ruler never needs to come to a stop. And this moving kind of gate never comes to stop either. And you can kind of come to a, um, through analysis of this, you should be able to come to a, um, so you know, there are two possibilities. Either this goes through the ring, or it gets hit by the ring. Those are two distinct physical events, and this is still special relativity or quantum mechanics. One of those two things must happen. So the question is, well, which one of those two things happen here? Does the ruler go through the ring? or does the ring somehow hit the ruler? Let me give you some minute to think about it while I drew a copy of that here so that we can work through it and, um, and we will uh, work through it. Yeah, maybe two, three minutes. Uh, I want you to have some answer in mind and check with your neighbor if they arrived at the same answer because I'm gonna take a poll at the beginning what you think should happen. I guess, uh, let me call it Chas paradox. All right, so how many of you think the ruler should go through the ring, uh, go through the hole? 
Like that's the physical event that happens. Okay, how many of you think the hole will now be too small for the ruler to get through, so the ruler will get hit by the hole, or the edge of the hole, rather? Some of you. Did you raise your hand for both of them? No. Okay, okay, just the second one. All right, so let's just hear the argument. Um, for one of the people who raised your hand on why you think ruler should be able to go through the hole, why did you think it should be able to go through the hole? Somebody, who raised it? Ryan, did you raise your hand for that part? So why do you think uh, the ruler was going to go through the hole? Okay, you think the ruler is Lorenzo contracted, so it's uh, shorter. Wait, do I have anything that's shorter than this? Mm, I don't have anything. That, well, so the ruler is shorter, so now it goes through the hole even more easily. That's uh, what you're saying, right? All right, so, um, and does that describe, for people who raise your hand for the first choice, is that what you're thinking, right? Yes? I was thinking so, well, so different. So, okay. Um, if originally, so not at relative speed, if it originally does go through the hole, then it doesn't matter because, um, because it, the length of contraction doesn't vary in the perpendicular axis, so it stays the same. So whether it's shorter, so what, whether the ring gets longer as it goes up, or the ruler gets longer or shorter as it goes up. Mm -hmm. I see. So when you say perpendicular axis, so that's why this particular example is three-dimensional. Mm -hmm. um, well, yeah, see, that's I'm not sure. I'm just thinking yeah. individually. So the ruler is going this way, yeah. and the ring goes upwards, if both ring don't hinge. So it helps to have a reference frame in mind. So what, Kevin, you are first thinking of this situation as well. Let's compare it to when it's moving slowly first. So if that's the, your starting point, then the reference frame you are using is the reference frame of the axis, as in someone who's standing at the origin and just standing there. That's the reference frame you are thinking of, right? And when you said um, length of contraction happens only in the perpendicular direction, then I think what Kevin was thinking of was for this, um, for this hole, because the, the plane is moving up, so if there's any length of contraction, that would affect the thickness of the plane, but not, si not the size of the hole. All right, that's fine. So you're saying in this reference frame, the hole doesn't, um, the size of the hole doesn't change. So, and you're, um, if anything happens, well, something does happen with this ruler, it does get contracted along the direction it's moving. So the ruler, is, uh, ruler does get shorter, right? Um, so that's a one perspective that you are using to analyze this. And then Ryan said moving rulers are shorter. That is the perspective you are considering from. From the perspective of this observer, this is the moving ruler. Um, did you have something to say? Is the ruler also going to look like it's not perpendicular though? Is it going to look bent? Because you're going to measure one side before you measure the other side, and in between that time difference, you oh, raise raised up. Time well, it, so it's look like it's it depends on the reference frame you are in. Um, so for, I'm thinking of this observer who's not moving here. The ruler, I think the ruler should still look parallel. Yeah, I don't see why the ruler would have tilt. Because if you're, you're measuring both sides at different times. Yeah, I think I see where you are getting it. You are looking at the wrong object. Let me, uh, let me repose the question. So most of you are thinking that the ruler should go through because you are taking the point of view of this observer, right? Let me tell you the alternate observer. What about for someone who's observing from here. Someone who's sitting at the middle of the ruler and observing in this reference frame, which is moving at the speed v. Um, um, so for that person, the ruler is not a moving ruler. Ruler didn't contract. What contracts instead? But no, it's not simultaneous. I know, I know, we are getting there. But what contracts? No, this whole contract. So it'll actually look more like an ellipsoid, or not ellipsoid, ellipse. It'll look more like ellipse. So, and that's uh, 
that's how it, uh, the whole is seen in this reference frame. And this is our goal in analyzing this and explaining. Because this is a distinct physical event, even in this reference frame, the hole does not hit the ruler. The ruler does go through. And now what we want to explain, OK, so how does it look so that even though this hole is uh, measurably uh, has a smaller major axis than the ruler, it still allows the ruler to go through. Yeah? And uh, so let me draw the diagram. That will probably help. And oh, I have only 10 minutes. Um, for those of you who came in late, we are ending the class about 10 minutes early. So I guess we won't get to the rigid body other than maybe brief mention. So um, your number one tool in analyzing any paradox is a space-time diagram. Um, and so that's what I would do, recommend for here also, because you can talk all you want, and it's really each to confuse yourself in flood of words. <laughs> so let me draw the space-time diagram that represents this interaction as well as possible. So I'm only really going to illustrate the x-axis. And um, that's the thing that, well, yeah, let me start from there. And uh, we will deal with the other thing later. So uh, it's because you know we only have two-dimensional space. And uh, it's hard to, we only have two-dimensional space. <laughs> So uh, I'm, I'm taking the, for this axis, I'm taking the perspective of observer who's sitting at origin and at rest at the origin. And um, let me, oh, sorry, I guess I don't want to be too confusing. Let me take the, um, let me draw the axis for the observer who's traveling with the ruler. So for that case, the axis would look something like this. Let me draw the light cone first so that I can draw this kind of reasonably. Um, so the time axis tilts in this direction. CT prime and the x axis tilts up in this direction. Okay. So let me start out with this, uh, the snapshot. The snapshot where the snapshot where the hole is right at the um, origin and the contracted roller is right about to go through the, the hole. The, the right about to go through the non-contracted hole. This is what happens at time equals zero. Okay. So for this snapshot, um, I need the word line of the ruler. I need the word line of the front of the ruler and the back of the ruler so that I have some marker. So those two word lines would be this time axis shifted this way by some distance and shifted this way by some distance. So, um, so this is the word line of the front of ruler, and this is the word line of the back of the ruler. And the uh, And the Lorentz contracted length that's being measured here. What the length is? Well, the position of all the locations of the ruler at time equals zero. So this is the this is the length contracted ruler. Okay. And um, at this moment in time, at t equals zero, if you are to locate two points, one end of the hole and the other end of the hole, the two antipodal points of the hole, then you would have, let me call this point A, call this point B, this would be A, and this would be B. Yeah. So, 
The last step is where I can't quite really draw it because to actually illustrate it, I would need, um, I would need a three-dimensional space-time diagram that uh, illustrates x-axis, y-axis, and then the time axis. Um, since I don't have that, let me, um, having drawn this to sketch out the, um, sketch out the moment in time when the ruler fits into the hole, uh, let, let's tr let me try to ex uh, describe how this uh, event appears from the perspective of this observer here, right? So, um, so from the perspective of this observer, um, the so this. Um, From the perspective of this green observer, this is what describes uh, t prime equals zero for him. t prime equals zero for him, let me do that in purple, um, would be this. Um, the location of the ruler here and here. So this is the picture, snapshot, of t prime equals zero for the ruler. Um, the reason I've, the reason this word line is helpful is knowing the location of the ruler at one point in time doesn't tell you where it was at different moments in time. And when you take snapshot in a different reference frame, what used to be simultaneous is no longer, they are no longer simultaneous. So, um, so I need to kind of be able to track this back. Okay, this is where it was at t prime equals zero which will turn out to be you know, different moment in time if I go back to my original reference frame. And so that, this is the ruler at this moment in time, t prime equals zero. And if you are looking strictly at the x positions, then uh, I don't think I drew this quite right. Let me um, move the points A and B in so that I can <laughs> represent it this more um, correctly. So at, at the, um, I've drawn this figure for V equals 0 0.5. So the gamma factor is kind of tiny here. It's not that big. It's like 1.1 something. So the points A and B are really going to be here, right? And let me, so this is A and B. Um, I guess I'm using the labels A and B for the event, both the position and time when it's there. So let me use a different color, um, orange, for the trajectory. So this, the one point of the edge moving up, this is one kind of trajectory in time. This is the trajectory in time. And if I sketch that in here, then the trajectory of this point, the, the part of the hole that was at this point, event A, looks like this. Constant x value. Right? Yes? So if you insist on the snapshot t prime equals 0, then it'll look as though this point would have hit this, and this point would have hit this. Now, physically, that doesn't happen. So, um, so if you are the observer sitting here, as you watch this hole, both moving up and coming towards you, what does this hole look like? So that as it comes, it, this uh, length of contracted hole, as it comes up, it doesn't hit your ruler. It looks tilted, right? The moment where this passed, uh, um, so the moment where this uh, far end passed this uh, positive end of the um, end of the ruler, it takes a moment at this time. Let me draw this line of simultaneity to help you visualize it. This is the line of simultaneity for A. 
So this is x prime for a or whatever. So this lies below my x prime axis, which means this represents t prime less than 0. And this line of simultaneity that goes through this, it represents t prime greater than 0 because it's above the x prime axis. So what that means is, um, so this far end, it does, uh, it does pass the um, pass the y position where this is at, but it passes it here first, and then it passes it below. So in this uh, reference frame of the ruler, this will appear tilted. And if you want to be all mathematical, you can even go this far. You can kind of describe the y position of this, y position of this as, uh, or I guess y prime, you can describe as a vy, so, um, which will be transformed, so vy prime, times t prime. And it's this value of t prime which will undergo Lorentz transformation. And um, even though all this happens at t equals 0, the moment where the t prime value of this, uh, so um, t prime here is negative, and t prime here is positive, and that's sort of described by all of this. Yeah. Yes? Makes sense? Yeah. So, anyways, um, that's uh, another example of um, example of special relativity paradox, and I just want to leave it at this level. So, vast majority of you will never deal with the special relativity. Even physics majors of you, unless you go into high energy particle physics, chances are you don't really deal with the relativity all that much. But when you do see it again, um, this is what I want you to take away that you will remember. That it's really important that simultaneity is relative. And it's a, such, a, um, um, such a kind of basic part of our, our life that simultaneity is absolute. We tend to make a very implicit assumption about absolute simultaneity. And really drawing space-time diagram is a way to break you out of that habit, to recognize when something happens before the other.